um, Hickory was our tabby cat, and who we had for many, many years, and very fond of. Um, but I occasionally have had rather serious-minded people here to visit, and they said, who is Hickory? And I say, haven't you ever read Hickory's poems? Very famous Kent poet, and they say, oh, yeah, yes, I think I have, but I'm not sure. A former army commander who has helped hundreds of fellow ex-servicemen and their families to visit the Normandy battlefields has won this year's Times Sternberg Active Life Award. John Magendy, 91, has organised annual pilgrimages to France for more than two decades, including a trip to mark the 65th anniversary of the D-Day landings last year for 75 veterans. Over the years, Major Magendy has forged strong links with the region where he fought during the Second World War, and in particular, a large number of French citizens who were liberated by Allied forces. He has also established close links with 9th SS Panzer Division, against which he fought with 4th Battalion, Somerset Light Infantry, enduring one of its bloodiest battles. In addition, Major Magendy has raised money for his battalion and helped to fund a club for veterans in the Normandy village of Everesi, for which he was awarded the Médaille d'Honneur. Uh, John used to be a telegraph reader, I hate to say, but... Last autumn he decided that it was getting too gossipy and too celebrity minded so he would try the Times and also because it's a easier size to hold. On the 14th of October I happened to notice an advertisement, do you know somebody who inspires great admiration and of course I could think of nobody better. I then noticed when I'd surreptitiously cut it out the nomination had to be in the following day by five o'clock so I sat on my laptop all Friday afternoon, luckily with no interruptions and managed to compose the following dissertation. Uh, for the past 25 years, my 91-year-old husband has organized annual pilgrimages to France for fellow Normandy veterans. He has led old soldiers, sailors, and airmen, along with their families and friends, to tour the beaches and battlefields. His friends and army colleagues thought he might finally call it a day after escorting a party of 70 to France for the 65th anniversary celebrations. Instead, another visit was made this year, including the installation of a bench near the Murray in Mouen, the first commune to be liberated by his regiment, to thank the French for their friendship, and preparations are now underway for next year's trip. He shows the same sort of energy and courage that he had when joining the Somerset Light Infantry, fresh from Sandhurst in 1939. He served with 8 and 12 commando for three years, and as a company commander with the Somersets, but to quote quote one of the many pilgrims who have nominated him for an award demonstrates considerable modesty and humility. All the visits are at cost with limited support from regimental funds. In the years since 1944 he has formed enduring links with the region in which he and his colleagues took part in some of the most savage fighting of the war, raising a thousand pounds for the PTA and an old soldiers club in the commune of Everesy for which he was awarded the Médaille d'Honneur he was also the architect of a project to have a bilingual regimental plaque installed in the church wall at Mouon and collected 1,200 for the schools in the commune and masterminded several visits to England for the mayor and his party. For the 60th anniversary com commemorations in Normandy, he was instrumental in arranging for His Royal Highness Prince Edward, the Earl of Wessex and Colonel-in-Chief of the regiment to attend was accorded the honour of commanding the Somerset Light Infantry veterans and was made an honorary citizen of Mouen. However, amid the celebrations for the victors, he never forgot the vanquished and arranged reunions with the Germans who had, had fought against him. Many people have put his name forward for honour, but let the last word go to Brigadier Alistair Fife, late of the Somerset Regiment and former High Sheriff of Somerset, who speaks for them all when he says... Hundreds of people, regimental and civilian, have benefited from John Magendie's kindness, generosity and enthusiasm. Some have been widows, bereaved relatives or veterans who would not otherwise have felt that they could muster the strength to visit these former battlefields. The young have been helped to acquire historical and political perspectives, and his concern and genuine love for the French people has manifest, manifested itself through his charitable work there. He is a man of great integrity, honour and humanity, as well as enthusiasm and determination, and it is impossible to speak too highly of him.
John, how did you come to join the army? Um, all my forebears, right back to the sort of 17th century or earlier, have been either um, parsons or soldiers. In fact, my housemaster at Winchester suggested the Salvation Army as a possible compromise with a tongue in his cheek. And uh, I had the, a cousin, a general, who was colonel of my r the regiment at that time, and he was instrumental in getting me into the Somerset Light Infantry. I think in those days, great love for horses and the sort of outdoor life of the army was what attracted a lot of us. And where does your name come from? Because it's quite an unusual uh, name. Huguenot. We, we act, we're immigrants. We came to England in 1700. My first forebear to be um, chucked out of France uh, was, a, was a pastor, and he was um, sent from France for making jokes from the pulpit. Um, he was a, a Protestant, and uh, he um, had to appear barefoot before the uh, church assembly of the Catholics for misbehaving so bad. Banger. And the, the line comes all the way down from him. Um, both my, my father was a parson. Before him, his father was a parson. Um, his father-in-law was a parson. Um, I've rather broken the mould. And my brother and I, neither of us went into the church. We both went into the army. And was <laughs> um, he was Dean of Windsor, uh, Bishop of Bangor, Bishop of Chester. And preceptor to... Preceptor to um, the, the Prince of Wales at that time. And he's your great uncle? Great, great, great uncle. Great enough. I wasn't in, um, academic enough for the church, quite honestly. Um, I was at school at Winchester, which has a fairly high standard, but um, I was very loyal there. If I got into a form I liked, I stayed there uh, for several terms until they shoved me up to another one. And uh, I didn't reach the great heights in um, academically there. I did surprise everybody by achieving five credits in school certificate, as it was in those days. And I passed into Sandhurst um, fairly high up, which doesn't say an opposite for, for the intelligentsia and Sandhurst, I suppose. Although in those days it was the Royal Military College, um, infantry and cavalrymen went there, um, and the intelligentsia, the signalers, the artillery and the engineers went to Woolwich to the Royal Military Academy. But after the war, they were amalgamated, and it's now the Academy. I joined a commando in 1940, 1940 and I was actually um, operational with the Navy, and we did a lot with the RAF as well. And until 1944, I never actually got my f foot ashore on dry land. Um, in those days, the commandos were not, as now, I don't think our standard of fitness was as good, but we were all volunteers. You had to be fit, and as far as the troops were concerned, had a clean crime sheet. I mean, these days, they go through, far, it's, there are no army commandos now, only raw marines, and they go through a very intensive training, but a little different in wartime. But we were all volunteers, uh, young and enthusiastic. And then, um, unfortunately, because of the um, the well of the, uh, there were a lot of people at the war office who didn't like what they called private armies. You shouldn't have private armies. Everybody must be regular uh, battalions. And they reduced the command, the number of commandos by one. And I was in 12 commando, but being the junior one, by no means, I think we were one of the best. The only way of cutting down, they cut us down, uh, and so we either went to other commandos, and my c cousin, the general, said, go back to the regiment, which I did. So uh, you, you, you served with Evelyn Waugh? Yes, and I got on very well with him. Um, I liked him a lot. He was extremely amusing, and his great threat to some of the other, never threatened me, uh, was, if you go on behaving like that, I'll put you in my next book. <laughs> and he did. And uh, I think it was put out more flags that it, it, I can recognise several people in it. Um, if you knew them, very, very true to life. Randolph didn't, Randolph wasn't in there. Uh, he had a very distinguished time in Yugoslavia later in the war, but he was the only person I knew. He was sent back to our unit from a course. He went on a course and they returned him after two days because he complained so much about the food. And when he came back, he said, well, 
And the reason is this. In wartime, you should regard all meals as potentially your last. And if they're not good enough, you should complain. And he did. And they sent him, sent him back only two days after the week's course had started. Sorry, that's here called Dermot, Dermot Daly, and that's Lord Peter Middleton, um, who became Lord Fitzwilliam in the end. Um, that, I think, is called Harry Stabberdale, Lord Stabberdale. Um, I can't remember the Scotsman's name, or this, I can't remember. Muck, you got it on here, love? Muck Gowan or something? Oh, have I got it on there? Um, Gavin Astor, who then became Lord Astor, I and mean, he's dead now. He was a prisoner of war most of the war. That's him there? Yeah. Okay. Um, myself, Dermot Daly. Uh, Peter, That's you Peter next to Gavin Oh, yes, Sudley. Um, the one there is Lord Sudley. Um, um, to what do you think you owe your longevity? <laughs> I have a theory about that. Um, <laughs> I would say, say large, um, largely luck. On it, really, um, anybody who's served in the war and had what is called all escapes are lucky escapes. And I mean, I'm not unique in any way. I twice the chap next to me was killed. It could easily have been me. It's just luck. I suppose I could. Um, quite a bit of thanks in a way to my uh, one of my uncles my father's brother who well let me just interject i always say that john never smoked and he never drank I'm and, he, just coming and he didn't chase strange women until he <laughs> met me so that's why no, uh, when i was about 16 i had an uncle who was a retired brigadier general as it was called in those days and he said to me do you smoke i said well sort of i'd actually started in one of the loos of my father's rectory and I used to smoke and blow the smoke out the window so nobody knew. And he said, I'll give you ten pounds on your twenty-first birthday if you never smoke. I've smoked one cigarette since then. His rector, he, when he was first ordained, I, at, uh, he was a curate at South Shields, and then he was rector of Newbury, Berkshire, for twenty-nine years, and then rector of Sandhurst for ten years, and he died um, in his late sixties only, um, still in, in harness, still... And he had a lovely sense of humour, but he had very strong views. Um, I, I mean, sounds pompous. He was a very good man <laughs> and taught us a lot. I was the last of seven. Was he evangelical or high? Hmm? Was he evangelical or high or middle of the road? Oh, uh, middle, yes. Uh, we no incense or anything like that. Or uh, an ordinary parish priest. I think he's... One disappointment probably was that he wasn't made an honorary canon of, of, of Oxford. We were in Oxford diocese, and once he didn't tell me, but I think one of my sisters, or about me and my mother, said, slight disappointment. But no, he was a, a good, solid parish priest with seven children, and he looked after us well. He had a lovely sense of humour. I suppose one's main memories are of... Um, almost bewilderment as to what was happening. One, one um, reads a lot about the fog of war, and uh, the fog of war is, you don't know what's going on. It's very true to say that, um, as an infantryman, your, um, your horizon is the rim of your steel helmet, and you saw no further than that, and you didn't. I mean, uh, classic story, in my regiment when one of our company commanders had a message from when we were in action advancing up in Normandy, um, report your position and he gave a map reference and did the report again and he repeated it and said well you can't be there because we are and he looked over the hedge and there were I mean, little things like that and it always you think that battles and war would go according to plan they never did so after the war, what did you um, <coughs> I do? stayed on the army. I was out in India um, until 1948. <coughs> then I came back to England and I was scheduled to go um, to the independent brigade that originally went, finally went to Korea. But by that time I had three children and I just felt 
I've had enough of being shipped around the countryside, and I, so after 12 years, I, I left the army. Um, I, as I said, I had five sisters, and one of them had a very um, ardent boyfriend who had a farm in Hampshire where we lived, and he asked me to join him, which in my ignorance I did, and uh, the, st the, the seed fell on stony ground the birds of the air devoured the rest, as it were, and uh, I had to get out in rather a hurry, and I thought, well, I, what is the nearest thing to the army? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I joined the Metropolitan Police, and I've never been afraid of a policeman since. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting, um, desperately boring in those days, uh, in, in London. Um, in, in night duty for going around the streets trying shop doorways and things like that. Um, I was based at Hammersmith and I remember on a freezing cold night with a streaming cold standing in a doorway and suddenly I sneezed my helmet fell off, <laughs> rolled into the road and I had to run across quickly before anybody, hoping nobody had seen. But one met some very interesting people. Um, and I, I, I transferred to Kent and I served as a policeman in Kent. But police in those days entirely different. We didn't have wireless sets, um, hardly any cars. And I say after two years, I thought, well, that's, that's enough. And uh, I had a great friend that, who was at Santa's with me, who, with a little bit of nepotism, had become assistant secretary of the of GEC which in those days the General Electric Company was known as the Generous Electric Company. Everything electric, even the wages give you a shock. Um, and I did 16 years with them. I qualified as a lighting engineer. I, I joined Kent County Council and had a rare, I rarely enjoyed my last 16 years of work with them. I had a budget in those days of, I think it was, a million, doesn't sound a lot now, the whole of Kent to work in, and I had a letter a few days ago from three chaps I worked with 25 years ago, no more than that, who I hadn't heard of since, because they read, they read the Times. And I had plenty of activity. Um, I used to take part in a thing called Modern Pentathlon, um, running, riding, shooting, swimming and fencing. And I got to a, 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 a very, a rather dubious probables for the 52 Olympics. And these days, the standard, I wouldn't have got even into the improbables, I don't think. And after several years competing, I became on secretary of that. And uh, my other great love was horses. I'd started to ride in point to points when I was at Sandhurst. And then the, the war came, and my point-to-point -point career, I averaged a ride once every four years, spread over 30 years, I think. I it went on to the administrative side. I did 17 years secretary of, on the secretary of our own point-to-point, -point, and three years as chairman. And then I'd always said, when I am too windy to ride, I'll play to start golf. And it just worked out perfectly. At the age of 60, I started golf. Uh, well, both, uh, I, I should have said I was married in 1940, and as people said, wartime marriages don't last. Last lasted 60 years, and uh, four children, 12 grandchildren, and I think eight or nine great grandchildren. I haven't counted them recently, but I think about eight or nine great grandchildren. And sadly, Rosalind died after 60 years, and um, I went on a, straight away on a cookery course, but I'm not really cut out to be a chef, I don't think, at all. The chap only said, oh dear, once, on four, uh, four sessions cooking, and he once said, oh dear, but that was the only time. And then um, Chris's father was in my regiment. I met her at his funeral, and uh, uh, a year later we married. We've been married five years.